Welcome to Beyond Inventory Optimization, a webcast series that focuses on hot topics around supply chain excellence and inventory optimization. This series of short webcasts is sponsored by Legility, and you can view them at any time online at www.legility.com. So let's get started. I'm Chris Russell, an executive with Legility. I personally have had the privilege of working with smart supply chain professionals in many industries around the world, and I'm pleased to be able to bring you these special interviews with some interesting and compelling experts. And in today's episode, we're going to cover a hot topic, a truly hot topic, SKU rationalization. Whenever we do something on SKU rationalization, we get a bunch of interest. So this really seems to strike a nerve with people. And it's interesting because there's multiple facets to it. The first thing I notice is that when we start talking to executives at these companies, they have sort of a gut feeling that there's something wrong in their portfolio or in the mix. They just don't know how to quantify it. And then the second thing is once they get through that, they look at how can they put in a measurable process to not create these SKUs in the first place because marketing and sales have never met an SKU they didn't like, right? Our guest today is Mr. John Janiak, and he's a seasoned professional in the manufacturing sector who has held senior operations management positions at multiple companies and has guided the development of enterprise class ERP software. John recently finished an SKU rationalization engagement in the retail industry, and we chatted about what he learned. Hello, John, and welcome, John Janiak. You have been through a project with us at a fairly well-known company to go through a SKU rationalization process where they did both these things, and I wanted to talk to you about it. Sure. This was a particularly good fit. They have a very formal inventory management project with high-powered people doing inventory analysis, and one of the dilemmas with these kind of projects is it's cross-functional. That's sales and operations management versus the materials guys. And these projects often never get off the ground because of that stovepipe organizational mentality. They had done a traditional inventory reduction program, and yet they still felt there was items left on the table. And trying to rationalize that and also bring both of the stakeholders together collaboratively it was really part of the challenge, both the technical analysis plus the organizational and repeatable process design. Yeah, and what you find is that it seems easy on the surface because you say, well, I'll just take the list of products and I'll sort them by profitability or by volume and I'll lop off the bottom 15%, but you can't do that, right? Right. That's a starting basis, and it ends up being the root or the major factor in waiting, but it's not the only factor in waiting because, of course, there's historic run rates and then there's future run rates, and future run rates have a lot less certainty than the the history. Um, Overlay that on the fact that there's a lot of missing data. Items fall together in collections, particularly as you go into consumer packaged goods and retail stores. Well, how much shelf space is being fought for? How many items are in a collection that have to be tied together and you can't just get rid of one? So the mechanics of doing it also had some challenges, but it can be done. What's the value? I mean, everybody has a gut feeling that there's some number, 10%, 5%. And there's some point of no return where the SKU is no longer viable. What are some of the numbers you, you, we discovered doing this? Well, in terms of actual net reduction, which was a collaboration between the category managers and the inventory analysts and everything, was in the 12% range by SKU count. And one of the interesting parts of that was that there was not a big battle over that. When the category managers were, were involved in the analytical process of seeing the hidden costs, etc., they were more than on board to go ahead and process these items. And now it is an ongoing process. They're out there on their left hand, and they're making new SKUs every day, too. So they're not stopping that process. <laughs> so one of the things you, you mentioned there was hidden cost. What's an example of a hidden cost of SKU proliferation? Well, depending on the organizations, I mean, everyone has a burden rate, but that burden rate is usually calculated once a year, and it's applied in a broad brush across the items. As you go a little deeper, you can take the traditional overhead handling costs and apply them with different weightings over categories. But probably the most interesting one was a category this company had called supplier direct. In other words, because they never had any inventory, all of these SKUs got a free ride because, therefore, they're not. there's no stock, so there's no overhead cost to them, right? Right. Well, it turned out there was $400,000 worth of overhead management and purchasing and materials planning layer. And so we were able to incorporate that into the weighting so that these items got kind of in a fair fight with the other SKUs. Right. Because you're not storing them, they said, uh, oh, so there's, they're free, 
right? But that's not right. the only cost. That's interesting. What are what are some of the other things you discovered that that might have been surprising? Um, the collections item was probably one of the most surprising in that it was well known, but we couldn't get the data. In other words, the, this side of the business dealt with retail packaging, and so there were collections that if you had this emblem on a set of a clothing line or on a set of accessories, well, it's pointless to get rid of three of these things and still have 18 more in that color and badge line to go together. And as it spills out into their project, one of their next improvement projects is to try to embed that into the formal systems data so that we can incorporate that into the analysis. In other words, weight things as a group where there are collections rather than just as individual combatants. Right, because the underperforming SKUs in that collection are part of the the cost of getting in the game, essentially. Right, and, and I'd say the other thing that we weren't able to capture but is definitely doable and in in the next objective side is that when you're in a retail channel, that shelf space battle waiting, we weren't able to incorporate into any formal session, but you can't just go and have 50 brands of cola and assume they're all going to get on the end cap and on the shelf and, and have an equal battle. The retail channel is making decisions on how they're channeling things too. And so bringing that somewhere into the category decision waiting is a definite, everyone knows it's a part of the equation, but we couldn't get a hold of it in this particular project. Right. So at the end of the day, you're taking all these considerations and you're building a matrix and you're waiting uh, in that matrix and you're doing sort of a, a regression analysis to come up with candidates, fact-based candidates that you say, these are the ones that, that bubble to the top of the list for opportunity. But then your part of value is you're sitting down with the, the supply guys and the category guys side by side and saying, you know, here's the candidates. What can we do? Right, and one of the interesting things here, which is typical for many companies I've seen, is that the category managers had clean incentives on revenue, not gross margin, just revenue. So upper management was involved in this project and helped to clear the decks on that pesky little hurdle. On the other hand, bringing in those category managers so that we gave them a list of candidates that we thought should be retired, and then they got to review them, and they could either accept them, yeah, kill it now, They could put it on a glide path to say, well, let's reduce the safety stock and look at it again next year. Or they could just say, no, I'm just going to veto this and we're going to keep this thing around forever. So their involvement in the sociological process was very important. That's great because, like I said, it's really interesting how many people raise their hand when we start talking about this. It really is a universal pain in most companies. So that's a very interesting story, John, and well said. I'm glad you could join us today. Anything else you wanted to add in terms of challenges or or learnings? Um, In terms of learnings, I mentioned upper management before. And even though they weren't involved day to day, in the final end result, they drove the fact that the SKU count, the category manager's um, incentive plans was on GM instead of on revenue. They built this into the, so the scorecards. So every month, there's a measure of how many SKUs were reduced, what your average return per SKU is, et cetera. So you want this to be a, an ongoing process. It's not just a one-time. Some people review this once every five years, and that's not going to do anything. By the time you notice something's dead, it's already too late. Having this happen on a biannual or at the very least annual year was one of the big lessons learned. So they built it into the process. Metrics, not emotions, right? Correct. All right. Good stuff. And thanks for coming on and talking with us. Glad to be a part of it. All right. So there you have it. My conversation with John Janiak. Recently returned from the front lines of the SKU rationalization war. I hope you gain some useful perspectives from his real-world experience. Okay, that's it for this episode of Beyond Inventory Optimization, sponsored by Legility, a leader in collaborative supply chain management solutions with over 1,250 customers worldwide and climbing. Legility's Voyager Suite provides comprehensive supply chain management from demand and transportation planning to warehouse management, from SNOP planning to inventory optimization. We hope you'll take a look at Legility's website, download some of our white papers on various supply chain topics, and see how inventory optimization can free up working capital, reduce inventory, handle uncertain demand with confidence, and raise your customer service levels while actually cutting supply chain costs. Just go to www.legility.com. And that's it for today, everyone. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Beyond Inventory Optimization. (laughs) 